And um, so I'm just going to read our, our guest, uh, our guest uh, speaker's uh, bio. And this is from her website and it's, who is Dr. Mo? Monica F. Anderson, uh, DDS and DBA, um, is an author, a dynamic motivational speaker. She shares uh, game-changing, life, uh, powerful life lessons with both humor and passion. Her latest book, Su Success is a Side Effect, Leadership, Relationships, and Selective Amnesia, is an inspiring work on personal development based upon Dr. Mo's professional and personal experiences. She recounts the numerous challenges she has overcome and the lessons learned with grace and courage. The master class in corporate ascension takes readers from the highest heights up to the depths of being diagnosed with a rare malignancy, along with other challenges like seeking life balance as working mother, breaking barriers into the corporate world. This extraordinary grandmother has come a long way from a childhood where shy Southern girls were praised for submissiveness and often discouraged from pursuing terminal degree. Uh, while practicing dentistry full-time, raising a family and hosting a Time Warner cable uh, television program in Arlington, Texas, she wrote a weekly lifestyle column for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, a major daily newspaper. Her book, Mom, Are We There Yet? That's the book, that's the first book that I thought, we thought it, we thought it was hilarious. Doris loved that book. Is, is a laugh out loud collection of readers' fav favorites from the 500 plus columns she penned. The popularity of those editorials launched her professional career speaking uh, over two decades. Through word of mouth, she, she quickly became a highly sought after speaker. She has a, a, a fantastic bio. It's, it's beautiful, it's long, it's, it's, it's fantastic, but I'm not going to uh, continue on. I'm just gonna introduce my cuz, uh, Dr. Mo Anderson. Mo, take it away. Uh, do I need to share your screen? Do I need to give you, um, uh, are you gonna share your screen at all? Wait, in, in case you do. No, I didn't know you, I was even taking it away. What? <laughs> <laughs> I was I supposed to have something prepared? I thought we were just chatting. Oh. You know what? You know, and, and, that, and, that's, and that's right. Uh, you know, I haven't really told her what, you know, Mo, I want you to talk about your, your, your life, your, your books, you know, your, your humor, just things that you've gone. And, you know, I've I watched some of your shows. I mean, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're pretty good on your feet, you know, that's. Uh, well, that's what. Well, Thank you for the introduction. I'm glad you didn't read the the whole thing. And uh, I uh, I have been blessed to be able to uh, enjoy uh, my passion, um, the right side of my brain, which is writing, and um, my profession by day, which is that I'm a dentist. Um, and I've been a writer as long as I can remember. I always tell people I don't remember meeting my grandmother or my cousins. They were just there. That's kind of how I feel about writing. I was always writing little short stories or plays or scribbling on something, napkins before I had post-it notes. I've always loved writing. I have seven books uh, published. And actually, my latest book, I got to get that website updated, is called Never Close Your Heart. And it is, uh, I write both fiction and nonfiction, that's a Christian fiction novel. I've written three novels and four nonfiction books, including Success is a Side Effect, which is professional development, work-life balance. And uh, I talk a lot about my diagnosis twice with a rare form of cancer, a sarcoma. I've had two major surgeries and um, I don't have a stomach. I don't have a spleen. Uh, they removed my adrenal glands. It was very in invasive, part of my intestines. And um, the first time I was diagnosed, I just thought I had food poisoning, went into the ER at three in the morning by myself, living in Austin, thinking I was going to get 
and IV and uh, learned that I had a mass and having been in healthcare for over 30 years, when I hear the term mass, I, I didn't think anything but malignancy. Uh, and that's indeed what it was. And it's, it's amazing how your life can change in a, in a word. You know, it's really not in a day, not in a paragraph, not in a sentence. But uh, when I heard mass period, that there's pretty much my life before that word and my life after that word. And um, I bounced back pretty quickly the first time they took part of my stomach, but the uh, they're still not sure if the cancer recurred or they just didn't get it all. And so within 18 months, it was back an even larger tumor and uh, I had to get that other surgery. And when I went, as I was uh, discussing what to do and they were telling me to update my will and, and how the procedure would be and what might happen when I, the last thing I remember is that they said I might, uh, they might have to take part of my diaphragm. I might have to have a bag uh, and going to sleep with that on your mind and your, your children and grandchildren looking at you is, you know, with those eyes of, of Tara is, is that's a very dark place to be. But when I came, came to my family was there and my mom said the first thing I said was did I have to get a bag out of all the things I could say that was what was on my mind. And uh, unbelievably, I'm able to function without a uh, stomach. Uh, a lot of people do have difficulty and I lost a ton of weight. I lost, um, I went from a size 18 to a size double zero in about six weeks, malnourished and all of that to say, um, I have really, I feel blessed. I've had a great support network. My faith, you know, whether it's Psalm 97 or Psalm 23, uh, my church family, my nuclear family, my friends, um, you, you really don't know what faith is until faith is all you have. I mean, when, when something like that happens to you, it's set, certainly not about who you know, the letters before or after your name, uh, there's, there's nothing you can do with a physical battle like that, but fight back spiritually and emotionally. And it really did change me, which is why I had been writing fiction before that. And I came back with success as a side effect, leadership relationships and personal and uh, selective amnesia, leadership relationships and selective amnesia, which is learning the lessons from your past, but deleting the painful paralyzing parts because we can't forget all of our past we'll we'll repeat it but those parts that hold us back and make us angry and cause us to have unforgiveness we need to selectively delete from the narrative so we can move forward with just the wisdom and not the weight and um it took a while for me to get back to the point where I could just make stuff up which is why I'm excited about my new book never close your heart because I, I write from really a, a fiction from my happy place. And uh, I was in a very serious place. I wasn't unhappy, but I was in a very serious place and a serious battle, just trying to keep my job, trying to keep my sanity. Uh, if you know anyone or you've been through it with the cancer diagnosis, um, I, I, whatever they look like on the outside, immediately after they hear that, there are just sirens in your head, just this screaming going on day and night all the time. It, it, I got robbed. I was working at Burger King when I was 16 years old, working at the cash register. I just got a promotion, worked my way up to cashier. You know, that's a, a treasure position at Burger King. And two or three o'clock in the morning, these young men came in, jumped over the counter, and the guy put a gun to my head, a very large silver gun. I, I couldn't even describe their race. That's all I could tell the cops was they had a silver gun. He was like, was he tall? Was he short? I don't know. He had a silver gun in my face and was threatening me. And it was terrifying. And that is what it feels like to get a cancer diagnosis, except they left. And uh, so that is a that is a battle. And to come through that, and I, I still take oral chemo, as Imho knows. I take oral chemotherapy medication every day. So it's 
when I talk about life balance and moving forward in selective amnesia, it's not something I read. Uh, when I talk about professional development and the need, the need to treat your family even better than you treat the people at work, the people on your team, which we tend to do the opposite. We come home and kind of dump on our family because we've given all the good and kindness we have you know, to the people at work doing things we have to do and may not necessarily want to do. Uh, so when I talk about those things and the energy it takes, I feel like I'm coming from a place of truth and transparency and whether I'm speaking to a large group, uh, corporate group, civic group, I just did a thing for the Girl Scout. I always just speak from my heart and talk about what I know and what I've learned. And I, I think we each have a lane and a mission and a message and um, whether it's writing, speaking, my podcast, I've got a YouTube channel or you know, helping others with my career in healthcare, I always want to empower and uplift people. And I want to encourage everybody to be the best you, not competing with them, anybody, but just being a better you than you were yesterday. Uh, somebody said something on one of my posts today on LinkedIn, it was kind of a snarky little comment. You know, we're all, 2020, we're all stressed out and you're either getting thicker skin or thinner skin. And it popped up when I first looked at it. It was someone from Baylor. When I first looked at it, I kind of felt the old me get riled up a little bit. And then I thought, you know, you you read, you may be reading tone into this. You may be reading negativity into something that's not even intended. And I just said, what do you mean? And I went on back to my job. I didn't call my best friend and ran and rave about it. You know, I didn't clap back. I didn't counsel her. I just said, what do you mean by that? And she explained it wasn't at all what I thought, but uh, you know, it took a few minutes. We were both working, but when I saw that, I was like, "Oh, yes!" I didn't go off on that woman. I'm so proud of me, because <laughs> uh, you know, five, ten years ago, I would have bit her head off. So I, you know, we have to celebrate the small joys, the little victories in 2020, and uh, that's that's it in a nutshell. And I'm, I'm just uh, happy that uh, Imho and Doris and, and are my family and good people and, you know, doing what they can in their community and their roles and their sons. Oh, my God. The kids are just incredible. So you, you, this is my honor to be here. I, I feel like I've rattled on enough. I don't know what I was supposed to say, Imho. Well, you know what? Uh, you, you know what? I Well, so, you know, literally, Literarily, if that's a real word. Um, it is now. It is now, that's right. Um, are, are, Mom, are we there yet? Mm -hmm. That was so funny. And my father, uh, my father has that book and, 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 he's, and he's read that book. So I just, I just read, you know, it comes from 500 uh, writings in the, in the newspaper. So I always thought those, those was your stories, you know, like, like, you know, traveling. I mean, I think that title came out before the movie did, you know. Uh, it did, yeah. yeah. I, I wrote a column for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, which is a major daily in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for eight years. And uh, it was kind of family humor, Ir Irma Bombay, uh, kind of stories about my family. They Some were, some were more serious when my grandmother passed uh, and I went through a period of depression um, and other circumstances, some surgeries I had back then. I, I would always talk about things, but bring it around to basically we can do this. And after I'd been doing it a couple of years, I was practicing dentistry. I didn't go to journalism school. I just have a gift for writing. And I'm not saying I'm the world's greatest writer, but I'm, I've always had a gift for writing and speaking. And so after I'd done that a while, and I'd also written for a little community newspaper when I lived in Minnesota, people started asking me to speak at different events. And my mother comes from a family of 15, nine brothers and six sisters, and they are all storytellers, all loud, all gregarious. So you just couldn't be part of that family and not 
learn how to tell a story. So I can't even say many things, especially in my family, because if you wanted to be heard at that Thanksgiving dinner, you had to be able to engage people and keep them entertained. And so I started speaking and, you know, after about a year of that, people kept asking, do you have a book? Do you have a book? I didn't, but you're not going to ask me that too many times. I've always been a business wonder and I didn't get a book together. So I collected about 80 of the reader's favorite columns. And that's that's what you read. But it, it started from those columns that I wrote as a um, columnist for the paper. You know, I just, we were just reading, I said, God, Mo is really funny. You know, those 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 stories are funny. And and Doris, uh, Doris picked up on it. You know, she she really she really enjoyed it. Now, your latest book, what's the title again? It's called Never Close Your Heart. It's a sequel um, to When a Sister's Fed Up, which was in essence bestseller. It was my first novel, and um, I've written a couple of books in between, done an audio book, and some other things, but people kept asking me about the characters. There was an African-American female mayor, Faith Henry, and her husband, Deacon, Deacon Henry, Preston Henry, who was a bit resentful of her position, and they had two children. And in their marriage, the other woman was the church. And so there was the <clears throat> family drama and the, the tension between the couple and how that, uh, and I left it kind of a cliffhanger ending. And it's been 10 years since I wrote that book. And even though I've written other books, that continues to be uh, the book everyone asks me about, whether I'm at a book club or just run into a friend or whatever. And so I thought, you know what? We're gonna revisit the Henry family and Never Close Your Heart is the sequel to that. They're standalone, you can read them in any order, uh, but that's, how it came about and it's just about forgiveness as I was talking about uh, earlier moving on and you know we say we forgive and forget but sometimes we just forgive and if we don't do that other part you know that that anger that resentment does more harm to us than the other person who has no idea we're still mad at them so yeah yeah um so how are your sons? Um, you, you know, AC, we got to really know well, uh, yeah. you know, your last visit. And uh, it seemed like he's your running buddy. You know, he seems like he, you know, he's, he's, he travels with you. And, uh, you know, he just seems like a great, great kid. Um, my sons are, are 32 and 34. And uh, Tony, my oldest, is married with three children. So he is so not my running buddy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's running, but not with me. Not with and uh, we were together uh, Thanksgiving. We'll, we'll be together over the Christmas holidays. But, you know, I go to their sporting events. AC is single. Uh, he's got a great girlfriend who I, I really like, but uh, he's, he's more flexible with his time. So they are well. AC had COVID-19. Uh, I, I don't know if I told you that. You know what you did? You did. You did. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But he got over it. Uh, uh, yeah, it was scary. It was scary. This was a few months ago, and he's single, lives in his home uh, with a couple of roommates. But he was, we had to take him to ER twice. Uh, they wouldn't even co test him for COVID at first. And I was trying to keep him out of the hospitals. It was during the first surge when the hospitals were so bad. And uh, I didn't want him to go to my parents. No one wanted him to come here because of me being on oral chemo, but you know, that's my baby. So we brought him here and um, I was following everything I could find. I was stalking Dr. Fauci, trying to figure out how to get him better and keep me from getting sick. And at one point, guys, he, my son AC works out five days a week, 32 years old, just really good kid, a uh, big kid. And he was so weak. He could not get out of the chair just to go to the bathroom by himself. And I was like, this was when a lot of people were still not believing we needed to wear masks and stuff. And I thought if people could just see this, what this has done to him. And um, 
it, it was scary, but he, he came around. It took a few weeks. He came around. I was working and cooking three times a day. I don't do that. I've been here by myself forever. I just eat lettuce out of a bag. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> so that was, that was some work, but we get, we got him back around and I did not uh, get COVID. Um, and I hope I don't. I hope we, yeah. we all get this vaccine soon. Yeah, I hope I hope you don't. I hope you don't either. Now, you know, Arcolia and I have the same birthday. So when I first oh, met her, we, your yeah. birthday in March? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. So we we just hit it off famously, you know. Now uh, Mo's father Jimmy is like the family. I mean, he he knows a lot about that side of the family. So he's the, he's the guy that I always go to to ask about this person or that person or, or everything. But I just had such a wonderful time. Uh, there now. Did you grow up in 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 Dallas Fort Worth, or did you grow up in Jefferson? No, I I was born in Houston, and I grew up in Fort Worth. My mother is from Jefferson, so when she retired, uh, they moved they moved back there. A lot of people think I'm from there, but I actually grew up in Fort Worth. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we in California, we think we're living, and then I go, then you I go, are. you to, are go to the south. You know, like okay, your father is. Uh, what is that? Six acres uh, that they. <laughs> you know, it's 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 sprawling, and uh, you know, I just thought, what a beautiful place. Hey, look, I'm gonna I'm 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 gonna open it up for anyone that is listening here on this Zoom. If you'd like to ask Mo a question about her books, about her her humor, how she's overcome. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, um, do you have? Have you ever been approached by like Tyler Perry or or Oprah or somebody like that? You know, with your books and you know they want to. Do I, I have I have not. I was offered a, a book deal by one of the um, major uh, publishers, uh, whoever is over Harlequin. I can't remember who the parent company is, and I did not uh, take it at that time. But I have not been approached about a movie deal. But I'm open to it. If you know someone, <laughs> we can we can make that happen. But that's. That's, I'm afraid that's I don't. Something that I pursue. Maybe, maybe we could just put that out there, you know. Uh, we uh, can put it into the universe. That, yeah. That's right. That's right. So yeah. I see I see Minister Macalisi on here, Fanya. If anybody, Minister Alicia, if anybody has a question for Dr. Mo, um, she's a dentist, she's a, a, a doctorate in, in business administration, accomplished author, and uh, and she's she's she has a successful podcast too. You have an impressive group on here on a Wednesday night. I'd actually like to know more about your your group and what you normally talk about. I'm not certain. Well, you know what, Mo? Last week we talked about uh, so Doris, uh, one of Doris's cousins. She has a big family. Uh, one of her cousins is married to this fantastic artist, and his name is Terrence Smith. And he he showed his, you know, he's a retired electrical engineer, and so now he gets to do the kind of things that he wants. So we had him on last week, along with her sister, uh, who, who does art. We've had a, a brother come on and talk about Bitcoins. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, and uh, I think somebody, some some of us, because they've, they've, they've uh, uh, contacted me to get his number again, because Bitcoins have gone, gone, gone up. And, uh, you, you, you know, so we've, we've had those discussions. We've, we, we, uh, Minister Macalisi is on here. Uh, he, he's calling in from Virginia. He's, a, he's our uh, uh, minister emeritus. He's a co-founder of our church and our 40th anniversary is this Sunday. And uh, he's gonna be coming on on the 16th and he's gonna be talking about, uh, among other things, the, the uh, principle of weaving. Uh, it, was a, it was a netter or a principle of heaven that weaved the universe. He's gonna include that. Uh, we have a lot of accomplished people. We have Minister Alicia Teasley on here. We have Minister Amadi from, from LA, uh, from uh, Karas uh, Temple. And we have, some, we have some new members on here. Uh, John Jackson is a new member. Debbie, I, I have a hard time saying you're a new member because I've known you for, for a few years. Um, you know, I, Sally, I'm going to have, the, I'm gonna have the privilege of officiating her wedding next year. I'm really looking forward to that. And, oh, well, best wishes. There are a number of great people on here. So uh, let's, uh, 
let's introduce each other. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. Mo, step in, uh, step up. And uh, so Debbie, I see you, you've raised your hand, go ahead. So I have a question. It's about the forgiveness and forgetting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I feel like, like all of us have, you know, things that we carry. Um, and I think I've put stuff to bed. Um, how can you tell if you have truly forgotten? So I, I really appreciate the, like, learn the lesson from it, but, you know, like, let it go. But what's the evidence that you have really, truly forgotten? So I can talk to them, whatever, but how do I know that I've truly not carrying any, any burden? Healed, healed things don't hurt. Healed things don't hurt. So <laughs> you can have an injury say, to your arm and it can appear that it is well, but if you touch it, you feel soreness. So from my healthcare side and having sutured lots of people and had multiple surgeries, I know that it's not well because it's still tender, it's still painful. So if, and this is, uh, my background is not psychology, but no, again, no, okay. I, okay, I was there and I've been through a, a lot of painful uh, situations and relationships and I had to learn this for me to move forward. But when I thought that I had forgiven people um, and it wasn't a passive aggressive type of thing where I was just avoiding them because that's not really forgiving. And I think you can love from a distance, uh, especially when someone is toxic. But if interactions with them cause you to feel some kind of way, as the young people say, you're upset, you're thinking about it all day, you're, you know, it's causing you to ruminate. If, if interactions are upsetting your spirit, then I don't believe that you've forgiven them. I don't believe you've let it go. If you can just move on. Uh, and it, there may be an immediate something, but it's almost like somebody just cutting you off in traffic. You don't keep caring. You don't keep going on about it, you know, for days, for hours, for a long time. It's passing and it's gone. There, there may not, depending on what they did, there may not be a point where you just you know, there's nothing, you don't have a flashback that might just not be humanly possible, but if it continues to disturb and distress you, um, you see them across the room, they may be a family member at an event. Uh, for me, that means it's not, you haven't completely let it go. Thank you, that was very good. Great question. Anyone else, anyone else? Okay, hey, don't everybody go silent on me. I've invited Mo. So, you know, don't well, make did they know they were gonna have to <laughs> they're gonna be they asking did. questions they and, did not know that. They did not know that. this uh, is all I have another one. Like okay. <laughs> you guys can sit there all day. <laughs> so this has to do with writing. Mm -hmm. Um and um like so the first time you did something, you, you were already doing articles. And I actually, um, I see how that's reasonable because all of those things that you did were really important pieces, each of them individually. So I could see that coming together in a book. But to just go and pull something from yourself, like I think I heard read somewhere that the first book is all you. Like it's just because you're new and so you put completely yourself into it. And I just want to talk a little bit about like, you know, like the courage or where do you pull something from to to decide that what you have is for the world. <laughs> if what you have is for the world, it pulls you. You're not pulling it from anywhere. Uh, it's kind of like being called. If you're a writer, you can't help but write, whether anyone reads it or not. Uh, you're going to be writing. You're going to be journaling. You're going to be, um, you know, you may have a something you're keeping on your computer. It, and it doesn't necessarily mean anyone knows about it. But like I said, I've always been a writer. I didn't choose it. I came here a writer. So the next step is to publish it because now that's your baby. It came from inside of you. And do you want to expose it to the world and risk people giving you 
one or two stars or saying something is wrong with your baby. That's the part that takes the courage. And for me, because I feel like I'm sharing a message that someone needs that will help somebody to, I don't like using cliches, but to cross the bridges that I've burned. I don't want people, if I can help it, to keep making the mistakes that I made. And so however, in whichever form I can reach people to share, I want to do that. But it's all about the word. So everything I do, the podcast and the YouTube, the books, the message, if you look at the heart of it, the threads are fairly consistent. So if you believe that what you're doing could be of value to someone else, then the courage is, to me, the struggle is to choose to not help other people. Uh, if you feel like it's going to help other people, they, there are only three stories. There's man versus man, man versus himself, and man versus nature. There is not a, people always say, I have a story no one's ever heard. No, you don't. But you have your way of telling it that is unique to you and will be received by someone who needs to hear it in just that way. So I, I don't know if I completely answered your question, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> I, I really think that's, um, you know, that's courageous, to, but um, not but because, um, you know, like it, it's always about purpose. Like hopefully most things that people um, love are uh, to benefit and serve. Well, I, I, right. I'm just speaking for myself. And so um, to invest uh, what you do in a book in, with that same sense of purpose, I, I think it's very important. One of the things my um, niece says, because every now and then she'll peek at a, a show, I mean, a show, a YouTube from the church, and, and I will say, I'm not sure we're a church, but um, one of the things that she says is um, that it's really all about education and that not only are the people on the on the website educated but they are continuing to grow mm -hmm. and um like for somebody who never goes to church for her to feel drawn because of that that's right. i for me it's a true blessing because i want to leave her you know in in good stead with good with good habits and right. you know and um and to think you know honestly when i first graduated from college i thought i never had to learn another thing i was <laughs> done <laughs> Not one more book, <laughs> nothing. CE no course. I, I understand the feeling, but uh, it's things that don't move are dead. So there, there has to be growth if you're living. And it's going to happen one way or the other, right? It can be terrible lessons or it can be planned. It can be a planned curriculum. So I prefer to grow with intention, but. Uh, that's and and uh, you mentioned someone was getting married. Uh, best wishes to you and also a uh, uh, happy anniversary. Forty years that's tremendous. Not not to cut you off, but I didn't want to forget to say that to mark those milestones. Those are two really great great events coming up. I'm very happy for those folks and for the for the church. Well, then, thank you. And and the next question actually comes from uh, Sister Asali, who's who's getting married next year. And so, so she just raised her hand. So go ahead. <laughs> Hi, peace and blessings. Hi. <laughs> um, I, well, I really didn't have a question. I had more just like a statement. I appreciate you, you know, sharing everything. And um, I like what you said about uh, basically, you know, showing your family you know, love more than you are being nicer to your family, um, nice to your, fam to your family more than you would do at work or as equally as you would do at work. Um, and that resonated with me lately. I've been, uh, me and my fiance, we've been trying to consciously work harder towards ourselves than we would do at work. Like a lot of times we, we can show up for the employer, making sure we're on time, making sure we get out of bed at that right time, do everything that we need to do for the employer. But then when it comes to us, it's like, well, we wanna you know, build better relationships. We wanna build a better you know, economic independence and 
things like that. So um, uh, yeah, that just resonated with me. Um, and like, you know, uh, what you said about that. And we'll also add that to our, you know, daily routine as well. <laughs> I, I, that, you know, that's a lesson learned. I, you know, as I taking more management courses and like I said, this stuff up here is, is to remind me about things. What's behind that? You know, what the, you know, you take all these courses to learn how to manage people, to collaborate, to work with teams, to communicate, and then you don't translate those skills at home. That's not just for work. You know, mediation, having difficult conversations, conflict resolution, collaboration, that's for everyone that you have a relationship. Love Languages, um, Chapman's book, that's not just for your family. That's also for colleagues. So we can't, you know, we're, we can't be divided like that. Uh, but specifically, your best behavior, your kindness, your generosity, your gratitude, just saying thank you. Nobody has to get you a sandwich. Nobody has to bring you a drink. You know, nobody has to say, hey, babe, I'm glad you're home. They, that's a choice. Every time it happens, it's a choice. And how delightful if someone continues to choose to do that day after day after day. And then you just stop saying thank you. That there's never a point at which that's not a gift. Exactly. And, uh, kudos to you and your husband for recognizing that now and working together toward it toward it because it usually ends up you know being a when you've reached a place of resentment and you're screaming at each other and it may even be you know too late to work Thank on you. those little things. Thank yeah, you. Yeah we're big on communication and we want to you know want to continue the foundation that we started on friendship. We want to continue that and then it just also goes into everything in life you know you want to work harder towards yourself than you do an employer because <laughs> you you have only you at the end of the day you know right. so right i can't wait to go to your academy award winning uh thing i, I you know <laughs> i know that you're going to be a success uh you know in, in acting i just have that i just have that <laughs> feeling i can't i can't oh, wait to, you to do? To be in the audience there when you when you get the, uh, you know, it looks like a ta, but they say it's an Oscar. So, uh, Mo, <laughs> thank success you. Success is a side effect. What is that? What 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 are you what are you talking about with that one? Um, uh, people, uh, a lot of people, they think success is a person um, that they've always wanted. Uh, that they finally meet or marry or whatever. They think it's a place. If I live here, if I have this house, if I'm in this neighborhood that I've been wanting to be in since I was a kid or a thing, you know, if I have this bling, if I have this to floss with, if I have this ride that that makes me um, successful. And in time, we realize you can have all of those things. I mean, some of the most miserable people I know are actually quite wealthy. So your definition first of success, you have to decide what success is, but I suggest not placing it on a material thing. And I suggest not making it a destination, reaching a corner office. So it's not a person place or things, success is going to change uh, as we age, but it also doesn't necessarily have to be something lofty. Having good communication with your significant other is success. You know, home ownership, regardless of the, of the size that you have a place to go and have shelter over your head is success. And really just being secure and confident and at peace in whatever state you're in is success. So when you set up things that will work for you that are valuable to you and that no one can take from you and you pursue those things passionately, success is a side effect of using your gifts to 
pursue your passions, which I hope involves, you know, helping others, engaging with others and collaborating to make this a, a better world and make every space a better space. Thanks, that's, that's good. I just had a, I just had a family uh, flashback. Um, I remember your mom telling me, she says, and Mo jumped out of a plane. You know, yeah. so how did, so, I mean, you do, you do some exciting things. I saw you in a picture, you're with Obama, you know, uh, I mean, you do some, you live an exciting life. So what made you jump out of a plane? I'm just, I just want to know, I never asked you that question. <laughs> I do have a type A personality. Um, I like things to go fast and high. Uh, I went into dentistry because I like um, hopping from room to room and having something different. I like doing a crown over here and a little bit of ortho over here and extraction over there. I like the variety. So what made me hop out of a plane was that it looked exciting to me. It looked like it would be thrilling and it, it was. I have uh, done some pretty amazing things. Um, and that was one of them. And the only thing they don't tell you is that as you're falling that fast from, I think we were 10,000 feet uh, high. And it's crazy too, because they just give you like a little hour course. I thought there would be like this intense <laughs> class workshop. And I did a tandem jump which you have to do the first several times. But uh, we went up after about an hour. They basically teach you how to follow the position to have and um, not really how to land. That was, that was not fun, but your ears pop a lot when you're doing it and, and for a day or two afterwards. It's really the only bad thing I didn't like about it. But, uh, oh yeah, yeah, the first parachute didn't deploy. I forgot about that. Whoa, um, whoa. Yeah, that's, see, that's that selective amnesia. I just remember <laughs> going up and jumping and that it, when the parachute comes up and you're just floating, that is the most magnificent feeling. But yes, I didn't know until later. My family was on the ground and I guess the first parachute wasn't packed properly and it came out and went flying away and there was a crew on the ground filming because I was writing for the Star Telegram at the time and I was going to do a column about it. So the people on the ground, the company is going crazy because this would be a really good bad time for somebody to die uh, at their company. <laughs> that would be the end of their business. So my kids said, Mom, they were screaming and they were running around and uh, but they had put me with a very good instructor. There was a guy in front of us who had jumped and he was filming and I'm just waving, no idea that I'm plummeting to my death. And if you see the video, you never know how this is going on, but the guy, you see him reach back again and he, it's on my Facebook page, uh, Dr. Mo Anderson, author, speaker, but the first one flies off and then he reaches back smooth as ever and just you know, goes for that second shoot. And we, I did not know until we got on the ground, I couldn't figure out where all these people had come from. There were just a couple of people when we, when the plane took off, but there were all kinds of people when we landed. So that was, uh, I don't know why I jumped out of the plane. I don't even have an answer. I'm just rambling. I just. No, you know, no, that's, no. Like, that's, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, you know, Rod did that. He, he, he came, he came home uh, from Howard uh, you know, around his birthday and, and, you know, he was turning 21 and he said he wanted to do it, you know, and, and, and I, I took him, it was, it was, a, it was in Davis. I took him there and, and like you said, yeah, they give you an hour's class. And then the next thing you know, you're jumping out of a plane and, um, you know, yeah, people, there's somebody that jumps with you and takes your picture and, and all that. And your mom says, yeah, I, I just don't want her to tell me the next time she jumps again. I just, uh, I just want to find out afterwards. Don't tell me you're going to do it. I see Minister Alicia, she was shaking your head. Did you have a comment on that, Minister? Le go ahead, go ahead. Um, yeah, I don't know what type of personality that likes to stay on the ground, but that's the type of personality I am. Um, so I...
You went uh, you went mute for for a little bit, Alicia. I don't know what happened. We we, we lost your 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 audio. Okay. Okay. Now Sorry. Now, you're back. now you're back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So I was saying, um, I wouldn't be one to be jumping out of a plane. I you probably can't even get me in a plane again. So, <laughs> yeah. But I did have a question about the success thing. Um, you were saying I was wondering if there is a good way. I had to write it down. A good way to teach the youth um, your idea about success, or is it something that they just have to learn and be able to grow and get that type of thought process? I think. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My uh, mic. I accidentally touched my little mic here. I think anything youth learn or not anything, but the majority of what they learn during their foundational years needs to be modeled by their parents or whomever is raising them, grandparents, aunt, uncle. I think a lot of what they learn is not so much what we say, but what they see. And when they see how you display your values, how you shop, how you talk to people, what you get excited about, that's how they get a lot of their ideas about what matters most. And, um, you know, we can all reinforce it as a community, but if they're not seeing that at home, if they're not being taken around people, environments like like you guys, taking taken around people who, who share your values, you know, if they're watching videos all day with, people with their bling and, and uh, their cars and their drink and all of that. And, um, you know, that seems to be what everybody is going after. It's kind of hard to counter that um, later on. I, I just feel like those formative years are so critical in terms of learning boundaries, in terms of learning to apologize to people, learning to share. There, there was a book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten, and it was a runaway bestseller for that reason is because we, we can't wait until people are 12, 13, 23 um, and learn organically, I should say. The other way we learn things, of course, is the hard way, which is how I got quite a few of my lessons. And my parents were wonderful, but um, that's really it, I think. And, and you know, I'm amazed too at the number of people who have come to me years later about something that they, that I did for them or they saw me do or heard me say and, and talk about how it impacts them. And not always when I was in a, a public forum. Uh, I think every staff member I've had over the years, and I'm, I'm in corporate dentistry now, has refriended me on Facebook. Uh, and said that I was, you know, one of the best bosses they had, one of the best managers they had, because I, I tried to treat people the way I wanted to be treated, like everybody was valuable and everybody was important, um, and they are. So I, I don't know a, a particular way we can just sit them down for an hour or two, but I think their exposure is, is really important. Thank you, Minister Alicia. Thank you, Mo, for that answer. So Minister Amadi says, another great session. I'll be leaving in a few minutes. He has to go at six. He says, take care. Thank you, Dr. Mo. Minister Amadi, is there anything that you want to say before you uh, before you have to bug out? Oh, it's just uh, wonderful to hear you, Dr. Mo, and to hear your wisdom. And, um, you know, I have this, I, I have a similar statement. I say, like, success is a byproduct. Yeah. Um, you know, as you when you follow the principles and you do, you know, you mm -hmm. operate in a certain way, like a principled way, then the success comes as a byproduct of you are doing, you know, you, you living a, a life of, of righteousness. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing, and I'm looking forward to, um, you know, getting you know getting into some more of your materials. And um, one one thing I did want to know about is your podcast. So how, how do I how, how do we how do we connect with your podcast? Oh, thank you for asking. What's my my website 
has links to everything. It's drmoanderson.com, D-R-M-O-E, anderson.com. Mm -hmm. My podcast is on all major platforms. You can put in Dr. Mo Anderson, but the <laughs> name okay. of the podcast is Perpetual Motion, M-O-E-T-I-O. Okay. It's perpetual right. motion with Thank Dr. Mo Anderson, um, Spotify, Google, Amazon, pretty much all of the major platforms. So yeah, I need some subscribers. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Uh, so Mo, uh, um, the book, uh, Black English Vernacular from Ain't to Yo Mama. Uh, uh, is that, uh, can you, can you elaborate on that? I will. I will start by saying it's no longer in print. That was my oh, first wow. book. It was published in 1986. You might be able to find a ridiculous, ridiculously priced copy on uh, Amazon. But I was, when I wrote that, I was living in the uh, Midwest. I went to dental school there. I lived there about eight years. And that was the first time I realized that what I thought was uh, Southern dialect was really, uh, it's called Black English vernacular, African-American vernacular, uh, a number of different ways it's referred to, but I was meeting these folks from LA and New York and we were, you know, all, whether it was Big Mama or uh, the kitchen referring to the hair on the nape nape of your neck. I hadn't talked about that book in so long. I'm having trouble thinking of some of the, uh, some of the terms in there, but essentially, um, you know, for so long, we were not uh, as slaves. We were forbidden from being taught to read and write. So we did bring over some of the elongated vowel sounds and some of the variants of particularly West African languages and as we have, you know, become uh, part of the American public school system, even though we are all very capable of speaking standard English, we still, many of us in informal situations, and well, now everybody, when I wrote the book, it was more African Americans, but it's pretty much crossed over now. Our languages, you know, our, our informal language has been appropriated, but most of us are by dialectical and that we speak in the manner that I'm speaking uh, now because I'm in a more formal setting with people that I don't know. And then we have a more relaxed uh, language that we'll use with family, friends, with people we're familiar with the triple negative. Uh, I ain't never, no, never loved a man the way that I love you. The emphasis on certain vowel sounds, Detroit instead of Detroit. Uh, there is a whole pattern of, of um, grammar and syntax that's used for black, black English vernacular. And that's the reason that you recognize when someone actually grew up around African American people or people who speak black English vernacular as opposed to someone who's just, you know, attempting to fit in. You can tell immediately uh, because they don't follow the rules of the language. So, me, I thought this is interesting and I just dive right in. That's not my background, but I, you know, I studied experts in linguistics. I studied, um, there are a lot of academicians who were familiar with this, but not so many people in the general public. And I wrote the book and published it right before there was that controversy on the West Coast. And I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember the details right now, but a school was going to make- e Ebonics, that was actually in Oakland where, where Oakland, many of thank us- you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So I ended up going on a tour all over the country. I, my book came out the year before that. No idea that was gonna happen. So I ended up touring. I was on a Tavis Smiley show. I went from coast to coast. Wow. Talking about that. And at that time, people were not. Now, of course, like I said, it's part of every major campaign and commercial. But at that time, people were not ready to accept that uh, you don't get to place a culture value on the way that I speak. The majority often wants to say that there's bad or good English, but you know, you don't uh, define language in that way. There's an, a formal and informal version of 
every language, whether it's one of the Romance languages, uh, whether it's Yiddish, there are different variations. And it is just another way to oppress people is to put a negative label on the way that they dress or speak or look. So all of that to say, I got so tired of debating people about that. I, I, that's why I have not written another book <laughs> about that. Although I could have, were my passion, you know, were my, my purpose trying to make a bunch of money and be on everybody's TV show, I certainly could have uh, done that with that particular book. But I, I mean, it's still out there, but I, that's just arguing with people all the time. That's not my thing. When I, you know, when I, that's that's a phenomenon. I'm sure that that people here uh, would um, agree. You know, everybody has an accent, but us. You, you you know, so you meet an so you meet an Asian person, they have an accent. You meet you meet somebody from uh, Germany, they have an accent. You know, but but we can't have an accent. You know, and uh, the, you're right. There's just certain words that we. Uh, that we uh, uh, participate and, uh, you know. So I see um, Mama Fanya has raised her hand. So take yourself off mute and uh, ask the question to Dr. Mo. I just wanna make a statement of, um, around Ebonics and uh, black language. Um, I remember when uh, growing up and hearing my mom on the phone and I could always tell when she was talking to her sister or her friend or somebody from church or the neighbor down the street or with a business person, you know, somebody from the phone company or the water company because her language would change. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I thought that was interesting growing up hearing the way she code switched. Right. With, uh, folks. Right. Mm -hmm. I see Brother Leon on on the uh, Zoom tonight. Uh, Brother Leon, would you like to say something? Uh, uh, you're, you're under no obligation, but um, if you don't say anything, we will impose sanctions. Uh, no. <laughs> so crap. <laughs> <laughs> Unmute yourself, bro. Hey, how y'all doing tonight? All right, all right. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Hello? Yes. Hey, how's it going? Good, good, good. Yeah. Yeah. Are we there yet? Uh, if I have a question, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of one. I'm thinking of one. I'll, oh, okay. I definitely will ask. Okay. All right, man. Just, uh, just glad, glad that you're on. Very, oh, yeah. Thank you. Very interesting. Very interesting. I, I definitely uh, uh, like the topic, and uh, Dr. Mo is uh, very interesting. So I'm learning a lot from her about that. So. I know, I know. We've just listened to her. I know she's she's right, great. right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yep. Give thanks. I'm going to ask the person that's uh, uh, K51 if you would if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself or, put, or you know, renaming your device, uh, putting your first name, uh, and that would be great. Um, otherwise, I'm going to have to put you in a waiting room, and you know what happens then. Okay. All right. Um, you know, Doris just walked in and she just said, "Are we there yet?" So she just she just walked in. <laughs> yes. yes, we're we're on our way. We are on our way. All right. Any other? Any other? Yeah, John, go ahead. Take yourself off mute. Uh, hello, Doctor Mo. How are you? Hi. How are you, Mister Jackson? I'm well, thank you. Good. I my my question. I, I guess you're a motivational speaker. Yes, right? sir. So I'm looking for a little motivation right now. Okay. <laughs> I have like a hundred and I think the last count was 110 pages uh, that I've written. Mm -hmm. Don't know if it's a book, if it's an autobiography, or what. But it's been sitting on my hard drive. I guess for about five years now. I haven't looked at it. What, what I, I published a book a few years back, back in 2012, a book of poems or something, uh, self-published. So my question is, how, how did you do your first book? You have seven books and you bestsellers and all this. So how did you how did you go about doing your first book? Was it a self-published or did you actually have a 
I had a publisher, uh, John, for my first book, but it is um, easier to get a publisher for a nonfiction book uh, when you're talking about a controversial topic. So I just kind of stumbled upon that because of my interest in language and words, which is natural for me. So my next book, Mom, Are We There Yet? I had a publisher, but I was writing for a major daily newspaper. I had the column. It was a popular column. Then my novel came and I actually self-published that. All of my novels are self-published. And okay. at that time, people were not self-publishing a lot. And, you know, as I said, it became a, a essence bestseller. But that was because I did guerrilla, guerrilla marketing. And I, you know, contracted all the parts out from the editing to the proofreading to the cover copy. Mm -hmm. I learned how to get a barcode and I had to go to classes and call people and sit with other authors, but everything is online now. There's pretty much everything you could possibly want to learn is on YouTube University or right now somebody has a webinar about it. But John, if you've been sitting on it, at, uh, is it okay to call you John? Yes. Okay. Love your background, by the way. If it's been there for five years and it's a hundred and something pages, I don't know if it's poetry or as well. You said maybe an autobiography, but it's novella length. I mean, that's long enough. Ideally, you want to get up around, you know, two to 300 pages for a full length book. But I would say to get you a, a writing partner and accountability partner, it, it's hard to stay motivated as a writer, when no one has given you expectations, a deadline, there's, you know, we, we all do better when somebody is looking for something from us. So I would get somebody who is going to hold you to it as well as a man of your word and come up with a plan. You have a, a plan for everything else. Just like we were talking about for work, you wouldn't let something sit for five years. You get it done. So approach it like that, because if you've still got it, you're still thinking about it. I just believe that it's for somebody. So the part about getting it published is not it. It's you getting motivated to make that happen. And you speaking up tonight, I think it's just the first step toward that taking place. But the information is out there. Get a book called Ape. Um, Usually have it in my office here, but A A P E. It's by it's author, publisher, entrepreneur. It's by Kiyosaki, something like that. Thank God for Google. But the book is called Ape, and okay. it tells you everything about publishing that and the self publishing manual uh, by Pointer if you want to go that route. But the big thing is just making up your mind and starting to set some deadlines on it. But I think you can, I think you can do it. You've already published one book. It's just getting back, getting back the fire underneath you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, Amazon uh, KDP there uh, that they, it has gotten so easy now to, uh, self-published you want to do a quality make sure you get good editing and a good cover but their process of, of uploading and publishing a book is fairly seamless now it's so much easier than it was years ago to publish a book and much less expensive but you have to do with them you have to do your own marketing right that's i think that's why you, my first book you have to do your own marketing with anyone I, yeah. I have friends who are with every major publishing house. They are not putting a whole bunch of money, unless you're Michelle Obama, mm -hmm. they're not putting a whole bunch of money be behind you okay. uh, to, you know, unless you're bringing Michelle Obama or somebody like that and you're bringing a whole bunch of people with you, they'll give you a small amount up front and you get your royalties every six months. It's, it, there's a reason most authors have a job. So if that's what's holding you up, they, you would still be, I mean, when I see them when, you know, now it's Zoom stuff, but when I was touring, when I see, saw them out, they were paying for it. So okay. that's, they're not doing that for you anymore. Okay, thank you. You know, dust off my other book too, as well. Maybe start yeah. some marketing with that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Mo, um, 
Uh, Doris just uh, reminded me your program dropped the drugs. Uh, you want to say something about that? Sure, sure. I have a nonprofit. Uh, our website is dropthedrugs.org. I don't have my glasses on. Hopefully, I spell it right. And this um, began with a, I was taking a leadership course with the American Dental Association. I got selected to be in a program. Uh, they picked 25 dentists from around the country, uh, thousands of applications every year. And I applied, somebody challenged me to apply and I did. And I had just, you had to, with your application, you had to submit an idea for a community service project. It's all about preparing you to go back into your community and do a service. And I had just edited an article about drop-off kiosk for drugs. Uh, thousands of people are dying every year from, mis from uh, expired drugs, misused drugs, leftover drugs kept in the home. And you can drop them off, not just during DEA take back day, but year round at uh, CVS, Walgreens, at police departments. And I was like, this was two years ago. I was like, man, I've been a dentist 30 years and I didn't know that. Hospitals, uh, you can go to uh, our website and find the location nearest you. It has to be DEA approved. And as I did more research about it, I found out that the drugs we are flushing down the toilet and flushing down the sink are not being completely removed, that the uh, wastewater treatment was never designed to remove all the antibiotics oh, and wow. the antipsychotics and the ED drugs. Traces of those are showing up in our drinking water, it, along with the hormones. So when you put them in the trash, they can decompose and seep into the underground water. And when you uh, flush them, they can also get into our drinking water sources. So I started a campaign here in my community in Grand Prairie to encourage people to use the drop-off sites because they incinerate the drugs. They even captured the uh, smoke to use for energy so that it doesn't get back into the atmosphere in any way. And I started here with the Grand Prairie Police Department. I went to the mayor and talked to him about it. And he had me come before the city council. They endorsed the program. And in one year, uh, we tripled the amount of drugs that they collected. So they had historically been collecting about 300 pounds of drugs. And when you think about the size of a pill, how small a pill is, that was a lot. But just by us raising awareness with this educational campaign, my team and I going out to community centers, going to new homeowners events, uh, just passing out a card that you can see uh, we develop. Uh, I am not, I normally have some here on my desk, but I, I cleaned it out so y'all would think I was neat. So I don't have that <laughs> right here. <laughs> normally have some on my desk but there's a great card you can download from our facebook uh, page at drop the drugs that tells you the type of drugs they take and that um, the majority of teenagers who become addicted to drugs become addicted to drugs that they are taking from their parents their grandparents their aunts and uncles we're leaving these drugs sitting on nightstands out in the kitchen in the medicine cabinet unsecured Wow. Uh, pain pills that we just take as needed, not realizing that the housekeeper came in and took three or four or took the whole bottle. People in hospice with all those drugs left and we don't know what to do with them. There is a safe way to dispose of those drugs. And that's what Drop the Drugs is about. Um, we've gotten our 501c3. We've gotten our uh, name and logo uh, trademarked and done some fundraising, which is kind of tough in this environment right now. So we're mostly doing uh, webinars and I'm talking to various people about health and wellness. I talked to a psychiatrist, Dr. Brian Dixon on one of our webinars, you'll see on our website or Facebook page about mental health and keeping your sanity during COVID. We talked to a dentist about the, the head of the National Dental Association, which is the largest African-American uh, dental association uh, in the country. And we talked to her about what it would be like to go to the dentist 
during and after a, a pandemic, why it's safe, why that's okay. We've talked about um, systemic racism and uh, police, um, you know, things uh, post George Floyd. I talked to a former chief of police about that. So a variety of topics, but all to get people back to our message. Uh, we can't just keep saying drop the drugs. So we try to attract people. And then we throw that in somewhere in the conversation. Hey, by the way, go clean out your medicine cabinet. So, yeah. Uh, lovely. Hey, listen, it's it's six sixteen, and we have a number a number of sisters on here. Right after this, Mo, uh, we have a, a section that's called Women of Wose, and Wose is the name of our church, and, wow. and and a number of them are on. And you may want to remain. I'm going to ask Doris to come, uh, be, but before she comes, um, K fifty one. You know, we're we're trying not to cut you off, but uh, we need you to identify yourself. Uh, so that we can uh, proceed. Other, otherwise, you, you know, just for security reasons, we're going to have to uh, uh, drop you. Okay, so if you're listening, K K51, uh, you're on mute. I'm gonna... Is that Shingarai? Shingarai is Shingarai, Is that you? Okay. Oh. I actually have to go. Um... Okay. All right. As well, uh, I didn't know about the uh, that the ladies were meeting afterwards. That would have been wonderful. Wait, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> hey, Doris, how are you, beautiful? Good to see you. Just think it was a year ago you were here, huh? No, that's crazy. The weather was beautiful, and you were, oh, you cook, man. You put your foot in everything. That's crazy. <laughs> I remember. You came that. Have to wait till 2021 when I retire next year. I will be back. Trust and believe. All righty. Love Good you. Good to see you. Love you too. This well, has been awesome. Well, you, thank you, everybody. You've done such a beautiful job. And I thank you for taking the time out and, uh, you know, using your energy to come and, and present with us. Uh, you've, you've provided a, a lot of information for us to consider. Uh, you have such an interesting life, and I'm glad you took the time to share it with us. Uh, so, and uh, a number of people have have, uh, have have talked about in the chat. And uh, Debbie has uh, updated a lot of things that you've talked about. Thank she you. I see that now. Yes, that is the book. It is phenomenal. Kawasaki. I I, uh, I was trying to think of his name. He's he, I follow him on LinkedIn as well. But he's he's really a, an impressive entrepreneur. But uh, yeah, any of you who are interested or have family members, that'd be a great Christmas gift. It's not my book, but it's a good, it's a good book. If I can help somebody, then that's, I'm gonna tell you what I know. So it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for this opportunity. I do have to run, but uh, I appreciate you, Mho. You, you just the best, you best fam. All right. It's great seeing all these guys too. I just realized most of the Zoom things I do is it's all women. So it's kind of nice to have the, the brothers here. That's cool too. <laughs> the brothers are here. The sisters are here. Thank you again. Next week, we're going to have an overview of the Husea. We're going to just read scriptures and pray uh, next week. And, and, and that's, that's what we're going to be focusing on. I, I, I saw somebody clapping. Mm -hmm.